Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you once again for joining the Rutgers Geology Museum's Ask a Geologist web series. So today we have a guest. Um, her name is Dr. Giovanelli, and she is an associate professor of geology at Barry College, and she will be speaking to us today about the geologic wonders of Iceland. So without further ado, I'm sure there's a lot of cool stuff that um, Dr. Giovanelli has to talk to us about. So go ahead and you can um, start your presentation. Okay, hey, thank you for the introduction. I'm excited to be here this afternoon. And my slides are not advancing. There we go. There we go. So the title of my talk is uh, The Geologic Wonders of Iceland. And again, I'm Dr. Tammy Giovanelli. I am an Associate Professor of Geology at Barry College in Rome, Georgia. And I'm also the author of an advanced geological concepts book about Iceland that was just published by Wiley in July. The book is organized into three parts, focusing on the tectonics, volcanics, and glacial features of the island. And that's how I'm gonna formulate my talk for you this afternoon. Um, but before I get started, most people are interested to in how I ended up in Iceland in the first place. So my first trip was in 2006, and really in 2006, Iceland was off the radar for most tourists. So I convinced my, my big brother to come along with me, and in the course of about 11 days, we circled the Ring Road, um, which is also called the, the Golden Circle Road. And also in 2006, this is before our GPS, so we had a series of these like paper road maps and there's hardly any road signs in Iceland at the time. And in July in Iceland, there's 22 hours of daylight. So you can't really navigate by the sun. So we found our perpetually lost, but we were perpetually lost in this beautiful and pristine landscape that would bring me coming back nearly every single year thereafter. Then in 2014, I acquired a wonderful husband and my wonderful husband has an amazing sense of direction. And so after 2014, we really started to like focus on looking at the interior and explore, exploring very remote places in Iceland through backpacking and hiking. And that really allowed me to like synthesize the whole entire island because I was able to then get off the ring road and, and look at the internal components of the island. And I originally went to Iceland in 2006 to set up a study abroad program for my students at Barry College. And, and preparing for an advanced geological field course, I really just delved into the, the tectonics and, and the volcanism of the island. And um, by the time a decade had passed, I looked down and I realized I had enough information to write a book. And I, I pitched the idea to a publisher and, and they loved it. So um, I've been going to Iceland since 2006, but I've really been uh, studying the island for the past three years. And so I'm really happy to talk to you about Iceland. Um, the thing that you should know is that um, I don't speak Icelandic. Um, I practice Icelandic with really good intention, but it's a pretty complicated Nordic language, as you can see on the screen. Um, so I'm gonna apologize in advance for any mispronunciations of words, and there will be many. And the next thing that I need you to know is that it is a talk that focuses on geology. And so there's some acronyms that you'll see throughout the presentation. And that includes MYO will be millions of years old, MYA millions of years ago, modern time will be referred to as the common era and before common era is BCE. Uh, additionally, you'll see a symbol that looks like a gold star and that gold star represents a hot spot or a mantle plume. And that's gonna be proved to be a big driver of the island's geology. So for the next 25 minutes or so, I'm gonna to talk to you about my very favorite things about the island of Iceland and how the beauty and majesty of the island is really because of its geology. So where we're gonna start is focusing on the plate tectonic map. You'll see over here in the right hand corner. So we're gonna locate ourselves by finding us on the North American plate, which is located in purple. You can find our Eastern seaboard. I'm, I'm down in the South in Georgia or up on the Eastern coast there in New Jersey. And 
North American plate is separated from um, is separated with the Eurasian plate that's found on the right hand side of the screen in the orange. And in, in the Eurasian plate and the North American plate are separated by something that's called a divergent plate boundary. So a divergent plate boundary is one where two plates are moving or pulling apart from one another. And Iceland is conveniently located on top of that divergent plate boundary. What's interesting and unique about Iceland is that, there we go, is that its geologic history is relatively young. So if we consider the age of the earth to be 4.6 billion years old, when we look at the last Pangaea cycle, that's what really formed the island of Iceland. So as we look to the figure on the right, you're gonna see a yellow spot that represents a hot spot, and you're gonna see that it, is, it originates at about 50 million years ago. So at 50 million years, you have a body of magma that's moving its way up from the outer core, and it's just sitting underneath the continental crust. So at 50 million years, you have your, your mantle plume, your hot spot, and that's gonna be stationary. And instead, what's gonna move is the plates over top of it. So what you're looking at on the figure on the right is the trail of where the hotspot has been from 50 million years up until modern day, which is represented by zero. So at modern day, what we find is that hotspot is still underneath Iceland. Its size is about 200 miles in diameter, and that's relatively big considering the size of the island. Additionally, what you'll find is there's a divergent plate boundary and that's highlighted in red. So at about 33 million years ago, what happened was the lava from that mantle plume breached the ocean and was able to pile up forming the island of Iceland. And we call that a plateau. So at modern day, we only see about 30% of the plateau above sea level. The remaining 70% is submerged underwater. So when we look at the ages of the rocks that are exposed on Iceland, they're at maximum only 13 million years old. And again, that's really young when we can consider the age of the earth being 4.6 billion years old. So that gets geologists really excited because it's such an actively moving and actively forming uh, island. So when we, we locate ourselves with the hot spot in yellow, the divergent plate boundary is pink in this diagram. And so you notice, and this will make sense to you, that the rocks in red on the figure are only 2 million years old. So as that divergent plate boundary is moving apart, it's allowing space for magma to come up to the Earth's surface and solidify. So the rocks that are closer to the hotspot are gonna be younger. And as you move away consecutively, by the time you get to those yellow bars, those are gonna be about 10 million years old. If you ever get the chance to go to Iceland and you get to the far reaches of the Eastern seaboard to a place called Eglisador, the rocks are about 13 million years. And then also in the very Western fjords. So it's exciting to talk about that mantle plume because that mantle plume itself is not a, a, it is not a static system. It's a very much a dynamic system that has motion. So when we're considering the body of magma in the hot spot, what's happening is you have warm lava that's compressed and then it's gonna cool and condense. So that's called a density driven system. So warm magma comes up, cools and condenses. And so it is those circulatory motion that's called convection cells that allows for the movement of the divergent plate boundary. So when we orientate ourselves to this figure, what we said was the Eurasian plate is gonna be on the right, and that was in orange on the figure. The North American plate is on the left, and that was in purple. And what we find is that those plates are moving apart from one another at one inch per year, or 13 miles per million years. So I'm gonna repeat that because that's a big fact. So the plates are moving apart at one inch per year or 
13 miles per every 1 million years. So if anybody in the interested in buying property, you should buy property along that divergent plate boundary because it's only gonna grow in size, right? You might have to deal with earthquakes and volcanoes, but at least your property value is getting, getting better. So I hope you have the chance someday to go to Reykjavik if, if you haven't already. Reykjavik is the capital city. And even if you're there for a short time, you can jump on a bus and you can drive about two hours to the south to a place called Thingvellir. It's highlighted in a star on this figure. And at Thingvellir, we get really excited for two different reasons. Well, first, it is the settlement of the Vikings in 874 CE. And this is where the Vikings established their parliament. And they probably did that for obvious reasons. If you look at the photograph, it's beautiful. And there's a presence of water. For a geologist, we get really excited about being Valer because this is one of the only places in the world where you can see a divergent plate boundary exposed at the Earth's surface. So one of the only places where we can physically see a divergent plate boundary above sea level. And so when you look at the photograph, you notice that the Eurasian plate is on the right, and then 13 miles across, you find the North American plate. And that makes sense because we did that math, right? So the, the divergent plate boundary, the Eurasian plate, moves away from the North American plate. And in the center of that is called a rift valley or a robin. And it's a low lying area because when you pull something apart, the area in the center is going to subside or fall down. And so it, oftentimes what we find in rift valleys is that they get infilled with water. And so that's why you see a lake in this picture. So if you have the chance to go to this national park and there's not many national parks in, in Iceland, but this is one of them, you'll be able to do a lot of hiking. And the great thing about hiking Thingvellir is that you can see modern day examples of how these plates are moving because oftentimes the, the blocks of the rock slump off and those are called faulting. So you get to see that active activity happening right before your eyes. So Iceland, because of its divergent plate boundary, it leads itself to a place to having a lot of volcanoes. So Iceland, that is the size of Virginia, has 33 active volcanoes. And that's a fun fact, so I'm gonna repeat it. Iceland, that is the size of Virginia, has 33 active volcanoes. So pretty much whenever you're driving in the landscape, you're either seeing a modern volcano, a feature of a volcano, or an extinct volcano. So it makes the landscape pretty, pretty exciting. When we talk about uh, volcanoes in Iceland, we separate them into three major parts. So we separate them into the Northern Volcanic Zone, the Western Volcanic Zone, and the Eastern Volcanic Zone. And so looking at this diagram here, you'll notice that the Eastern Volcanic Zone is in the, so the south of Iceland. And the Eastern Volcanic Zone is, is known to be where the biggest and baddest volcanoes are in the island. Now, when we locate ourselves with a hot spot on this diagram, and you can start to see where those volcanoes are because they're labeled one through 33. So when you look, you should start to see a pattern emerge. And that pattern is that the volcanoes are located on the divergent plate boundary. That's right. So when you, when you take a look at where the location is of the divergent plate boundary, it makes sense that that's where the majority of those volcanoes would be because as you have spreading, you have the ability to move magma closer and closer to the Earth's surface. So again, of those 33, the ones that we see most activity and most violent activity is gonna be in the Eastern Volcanic Zone. So what's also exciting about Iceland relating to volcanoes is that Iceland, again, is one of the only places in the world where you can see just about every single volcanic feature in one small location. So this is why volcanologists and, and geologists just love to travel to, 
to Iceland because you can see so much and do so much research and make so many comparisons be between these different landscapes. So these are my very, my very favorite volcanic features that I wanna introduce you to. The first one is called a rootless cone. And you can see the picture on the screen and it looks like a volcano, but in fact, it's not. It's called a crater or a pseudo crater. So, so how these are formed is you have lava and that lava is flowing at the earth's surface and it comes into contact with a body of water. A body of water might be a lake, it might be a stream, it might be permafrost. But what's happening is when the lava comes into contact with the water, you get a one-time steam explosion. So you get a one-time eruption and then these become dormant. So you get, to the, you get the remnant of a crater in the landscape, but you don't have to worry about them exploding ever again. And the neat thing about these is that usually there's not just one crater, there's many craters in a row, and that's called the crater complex. So this photograph was taken in the north of Iceland at a place called Mývatn. Um, and there's another place in the south of Ruhaler, and there's 51 of these different craters in one location. So it kind of feels like you're on the, on the moon and they range in size. But the neat thing is, is that you can trace where the lava had flown had in the past, had flowed in the past. The next is columnar basalt. And so columnar basalt is truly a physics phenomenon. So you're imagining these long, tall columns in an environment and how these form is also with the presence of water. But this time you're imagining that you have a body of magma that's working its way up from below the ground. And what happens is it's coming into contact with water at, the, at its upper surface at the top. And that might be a lake or it might be glacial ice. So as that magma is working its way up to the surface and it comes in contact with water, this time is the water is acting to contract the crystallization of the magma. So it's slowing down the process. And as it slows down that crystallization process, it begins to form these beautiful pentagon uh, formations. So if you look down on top of it, you can see a five-sided um, five column. And that picture was taken in a place called Vic, also in the south. The next is pillow basalt. And pillow salts are, are near and dear to my heart because they um, are really important when you start to study and think about climate change. Um, you might be familiar with modern day pillow basalts forming if you've followed any of the Hawaiian, uh, Hawaiian activity in 2018 or 2019 where you could see these actually forming before our eyes. So in this case, uh, lava is flowing down the flank of a volcano it's coming into contact with the ocean. And as it comes into contact with the ocean, instead of contracting, like we saw with the columnar basalts, they, they expand. And so you end up with these fantastic pillow-like features that form. And so they give you an idea of where the ancient, or paleo, paleo means ancient, ancient coastline used to be. And of course, like there's a lot of fancy math that has to truly go into that to, to calculate because there's erosion and there's subsidence, but it gives us a starting point if we want to think about where was the sea level in ancient time. So we find these around the perimeter of the island. So we said that the eastern volcanic zone is some of the the places the biggest and baddest volcanic activity has happened on the island. And so we verify that by using a science that's called tephrochronology. So tephrochronology is the study of looking at volcanic ash over time. So when you have a volcanic eruption, the ash goes up in the atmosphere and it will eventually settle back down onto the ground. And that gets incorporated into the geologic record. So then you can go back and look for every different volcanic eruption that has happened on the island. And every eruption that does happen has a different mineralogy. And so essentially it has a different fingerprint. So you can figure out which of the layers relates to which of the volcanoes and the volcanic events. So when we do that, we can verify that 80% of the eruptions on the island of Iceland have come from the Eastern volcanic zone. 
And then moreover, we can establish something called a recurrence interval. So as a geologist, we'd like to ask the question, how often do volcanic events occur? And when we do that, we can look at the temper chronology and we can say that typically on the island of Iceland, we see between 20 and 25 eruptions happening every century. So every 100 years, there's 25 eruptions. So you can imagine in a human lifetime, maybe living to 100 years, you're gonna see at least four different volcanic events if you're living on the island of Iceland. So I wanna to talk to you about three of my very favorite volcanoes that are in the Eastern volcanic zone. Um, volcanoes in Iceland are named after females. And that's for obvious reasons, because they're beautiful, they're complex, and they have the ability to change the world around them. So my first volcano is Hecla. And I just love going to Hecla. Um, it's, it's pretty remote, so hardly anybody goes there. It's like a little bit of a challenge. It's toward the interior of the island. And, uh, and I just think she is so majestic in the, the landscape, because the landscape around it is pretty, pretty flat and pretty desolate. And then you see this beautiful composite volcano. So Hecla um, has proven to be quite a nuisance to the Vikings. So since the settlement of the Vikings in 874, it erupted about 18 times. So I can just imagine being a Viking and living in the flanks of the, of the volcano. You can see a house in the picture and just imagining it erupting. And now you have to move all your cattle and you have to pick out all the volcanic ash. Um, and so it's a recurring theme if you're living in the flanks, certainly, of Hecla. The other interesting thing is that Hecla um, has an interesting repose. Repose is also what we call a recurrence interval. And so Hecla erupted in 1970, 1980, 1990, and then again in 2000. But since then, it's been dormant. And that's a big question mark for scientists. So it's been dormant for the past 20 years. And honestly, if you're living next to a volcano, you really want it to have a recurrence interval because then it has predictability and the energy is not being stored. Also in the Eastern volcanic zone is Katla. Uh, Katla also erupting 20 times during Viking settlement. Katla is a much older volcano. So Katla originated about 10,000 years BCE before common era. So it's a much older volcano that has been around. The last time Katla erupted was in 1918. So Katla has been dormant for more than a hundred years. And Katla is adjacent to this volcano, which I'm gonna call Efenla Jokul, but it's not quite how you say it in Icelandic. The term Jokul means glacier, so it's a glaciated volcano. So um, you might be familiar with Evan Jokul though, because this volcano erupted on March 10th, 2010. And when this volcano erupted, it disrupted air traffic patterns going and coming from Europe for about three days. So the ash cloud was about 14 miles high. So it exceeded our atmosphere and it was into the stratosphere. So the volcanic ash caused a problem for air traffic whereby grounding about 100,000 flights, causing 10 million passengers to change their travel plans, and it cost about $50 billion in gross domestic product. So this um, recent volcanic activity really shows us why we should pay attention to the recurrence interval of volcanoes. Now, FN is a neighbor to Katla, and they are connected by a lateral magma chamber that's below the surface. So typically, when one of those volcanoes goes off, the other volcano goes off. And that's what we see in the Tephro chronology record. However, what I said to you was, Katla has been dormant since 1918. So it is, um, it's interesting to think about, and if you ask any geologist or any volcanologist, or any person living on Iceland, they're going to say that Katla is the, the natural disaster that they're most concerned about because it's been dormant for more than 100 years. 
and its nearby neighbor has recently erupted. So Katla is the volcano that we're watching. So we talked about tectonics, we talked about volcanics, and now I wanna talk a little bit about, about glaciers. So this is one of my very favorite pictures um, that I took in Iceland, and it's showing you um, just a small portion of Vatnajökull. Vatnajökull is Europe's largest glacier. Um, it initially expanded on Iceland 2.7 million years ago and to about 26,000 years. Now, 26,000 years ago, it, the ice sheet entirely covered the island of, of Iceland. That's called the last glacial maximum. So at modern day, only about 14% of the island is covered in a glacier. And the size of Vatnajökull at modern day is about 5,000 square miles. Um, what I want you to take away with when we think about glaciers is that they are dynamic systems. They're not static, so they're, they have a whole lot of energy and they like to move from high elevation down to low elevation. And when they do that, they scour the bedrock that's underneath them to create glacial valleys. And that's what you're seeing in this cross section here in this picture. So you're seeing a, a valley glacier, also called an outlet glacier, that is moving from high elevation down to lower elevation. And I wanna give you, show you this little video because it kind of gives us a perspective on how big these systems are. I think one thing that was most shocking to me when I went to Iceland the first time is I expected the glaciers to be pristine. I expected them to be completely white. And as you're seeing from this little clip, by no means are glaciers completely white. And that's because they're carrying all the sediment that they are scouring and incorporating it into its system. Additionally, because there's 33 active volcanoes, there's a lot of volcanic ash that falls on top of them. So that also gets incorporated into the system. So this video is showing that glacier moving up towards the top of the ice sheet. What's also interesting is that Vatnajökull covers four volcanoes. So there's four volcanoes that are underneath this 5,000 square mile ice sheet. So your question might be, what happens when you have a volcanic eruption underneath an ice sheet? And I'll tell you, you have a catastrophic event that happens in the terms of a major flood. And these are called jokalips. So you have a volcano and that volcano has a, a magma chamber. And that magma chamber works its way up to the bottom of the glacier that's on top of it, and it begins to melt. So volcanoes have a caldera, and that caldera acts as a basin to hold that water. So the good news is that geologists know the size and shape and depth of those calderas, and we also can monitor the rate at which the water is melting. So we can measure how quickly those calderas fill up time. And so they're, as they're filling up over time, eventually the, the basin can no longer hold any water and you'll have a major flooding event. But those flooding events are predictable. Uh, one of the last major flooding events was at Grimsbotten in 1996, also in the Eastern Volcanic Zone. And this flood event produced a discharge of 180,000 cubic feet per second of water flowing down the flanks of that volcano into the Atlantic Ocean. So you get a massive flooding event that had energy, it had enough energy to take down the bridge um, of the ring road. So connecting the Eastern to the Western, again, is the ring road. And this system had enough energy that it wiped out that bridge. And that's what you're seeing in, in the picture here. This is near a national park called Skatafell National Park in the South, in the Eastern Volcanic Zone. So the good news, is that geologists were on top of it. Um, in Iceland, they have the Icelandic Meteorological Society and they put out a warning that they understood that this flooding event was gonna happen, so no lives were lost. Um, I'd like to go back to Katla because Katla is the biggest and baddest volcano in Iceland at modern day and also in the past. So um, at Katla, Katla is, covered by the glacier, okay? So Katla is also covered by Vat and Jokul. And when we look in the Tepercology record, when we look for, for signatures of past flooding events, 
Catla has an extensive record. So here um, on the diagram, you see the glacial ice in blue, Catla is underneath it. And what I wanna focus your attention on is the, is the, um, the, yellow, the yellow stream. And that's gonna represent a flood from 1755. So when Catla erupted in 1755, it produced enough discharge to equivalent the Amazon River. So the discharge of Catla 1755 of a flood was 1 million cubic feet per second. So this is um, such a catastrophic event. It is called a mega flood, a mega flooding event. And it's also referred to as a, as a cataloupe. So I don't want to leave our talk with just death and destruction. I want to leave it on a happy note. So we're going to talk about the Blue Lagoon. So you might have had friends go to the Blue Lagoon. Kim Kardashian and Kanye went to the Blue Lagoon. And you too can go to the Blue Lagoon for about $70. And that $70 can let you soak in a geothermal wastewater pool all day. Doesn't sound as glamorous now, does it? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's really a wastewater situation that, that they're dealing with, but it's a very glamorous wastewater situation. So let me tell you how this works. Um, the Blue Lagoon is on the Rainies Peninsula. It's about two hours south of Reykjavik. And, um, and there's groundwater that's below the surface and that groundwater heats up, right? Cause it's adjacent to the magma plume. So it heats up, but in this location, in this location, it is, um, it is too hot. The water is too hot for people to utilize or to transport. So what has to happen is they have to build a retention pond for the water to go into, and then the water cools off, and then it's transported to the city of Reykjavik to be used for energy. Um, the second thing that has to happen is on the Rainies Peninsula, there's a high level of silica in the water. Silica is a mineral, and, it's, it, has to be and it has to be um, a, it is, a mineral that is corrosive and it also clogs the pipes. So you have to get rid of the silica content before you can transport the water to, to Reykjavik. So the silica is what gives the water that milky blue like color that you see in the picture. And if you ever go to the Blue Lagoon, there's these beautiful Icelandic people and they walk around with these vats of silica and you, they encourage you to put it on your face and they talk about it being the fountain of youth and, it, and it's great for pictures. Iceland then um, is really a, a place I, I love. Um, they are 100% renewable on energy. So they're using about 13% for geothermal and then the rest comes from hydroelectricity. So the meltwater off of those glaciers are, are channelized for the purposes of, of utilizing them for energy. The construction of the dams that they use are very small scale. So the majority of the population in Reykjavik it lives in Reykjavik, about 200,000 people. And then there's only 100,000 Icelanders outside of that capital city. So the, the hydroelectricity is very small. So we're not talking large Hoover Dam capacity type of dams. And, and as part of their culture, they're very just connected to the environment and they appreciate the environment. They appreciate having sustainable energy. And by no means do they want to destroy their beautiful landscapes. So I think I'm gonna stop my talk here. And um, before I do that, I, I obviously have to thank my wonderful husband. Uh, he lets me talk about Iceland as much as I want to. <laughs> and so that's a benefit to me. I've had some fantastic undergraduate students at Berry College help me with this book. Um, University of Nebraska, one of my alma maters has been a great champion for me. And I need to thank my publishers at Wiley. So I'm happy to answer any questions comments i know that you have some i'm excited to see what we what we have in store okay that was really great thank you so much um so you can stop sharing your screen and um there are many questions on the document shared with you okay let's see here I'm going to work my way up in the chat. So 
Yeah. Oh, there's somebody in the audience. Pat, um, as the geology of, of Iceland by Irnesa, which dates to 1991, how's my book different? Um, what's new? So I, the organization on my book is quite different. So I separate the content into, into specifically tectonics, volcanics, and glacier features. And I, I do that because I think that, that, that tectonics is the, is the driver of where the volcanics and glacier features are gonna meet. And so the organization is a little bit, is a little bit different. Um, additionally, I'm looking at, um, at all the modern peer review data. So starting from 2016 and, and moving back. So I'm filling in almost 20 years worth of, of scientific data to bring it, to bring the content of the book really current. Hey, Tammy, could you un can you stop sharing your screen so we can see you while you answer the questions? Uh, uh, Pat also says about 18 months after the most recent eruption, he found a large piece of black pumice on the beach at Sandy Hook in New Jersey. That's amazing. Oh, here's a good question by Muffin. Um, how do we know that very large glaciers covered all of Iceland? Um, so we use something in geology called the present is the key to the past, and the past is the key to the present. So, um, so remembering how glaciers have uh, have energy. So when they're scouring the bedrock, they leave a trail. So it's a it's something called striations or, or glacial grooves. So after the ice sheet begins to melt backwards, you can still see the scouring and the direction of movement preserved on the, on the landscape itself. Um, additionally, it, that, um, that by about 26,000 years ago, the entirety of Iceland was covered in an ice sheet. And so, um, so on, the, on the edges of where that ice sheet expanded off of the continent, there's something that's called ice rafted debris. So again, when you look at the glacier and you see, um, you see like it's dirty. It's got all of the all of the things that it was carrying with it from up gradient to down gradient. And let's say that meets the edge of the ocean and is on an ice sheet. Well, eventually the ice sheet is going to to melt, right? So it's eventually going to go far off, far enough off the continental uh, crust off the edge of the island and melt. And so that, I, that debris that was in the ice sheet falls to the bottom. And so we can look for those signatures around the island of Iceland um, when we do like bathymetric maps. So like when we're, when we're looking at the edges of the plateau, we can, we can map where those ice wrapped debris deposits are. Um, and so that, that's been a really good indicator as to how we knew how far that ice sheet actually went. And then we can, um, and then we can date those events too. So um, we have to do different indicators. There's something that's called a cosmogenic nucleide that we can look for within the ice rafted debris. Good question. Okay, this one is from Christopher. How do geologists such as yourself know what geological or environmental event took place based on the geomorphology of a particular landscape? So I think it depends on, um, it depends on the type of event that we're looking for. So I mentioned tephrochronology is one way that we understand volcanoes. Um, Within that, we look for flood deposits. So we, that's how we have an understanding that Catla had a major flood uh, in 1755. So we look for, um, so essentially that's exactly right. We look for geomorphic indicators to tell us, to give us clues of what has happened in the past. And, um, and again, like we, we look for the present as a key to the past and the past as a key to the present. So if you have a modern day flood event, you can look to see how those get stored in the geologic record. So like when you have um, a flood, the water gets muddy, it overflows its banks. 
And so then after the after the water recedes, it still leaves a layer of mud, right? So that's what we that gets trapped in the in the geologic record. So we can look for those signatures. For the for the glacial movement, they're scouring the those valleys. And so even after the glacier itself is gone, you can still see where the glacier was. And we know that because we can we know the behavior of modern glaciers. Thank you for that question. Ah, um, Pat said, I didn't mention the black sand beaches. That's uh, the black sand beaches are in Vic where that column river salt is. Okay, so now I am, let's see, I'm on. Okay, Ms. Gill's fourth grade class from East Brunswick, New Jersey, would like to know, is glacial ice colder than regular ice? Wow, this is a great question. Um, okay, so when we think of, um, of ice, and I, I think you might have already studied this in fourth grade, we can think of it also in terms of like a rock cycle. So, um, so you have, let's say you have um, ice, you have snow first, and then your snow gets compacted and it gets compacted into fern. And then um, that fern will go through different processes depending on its rate of compaction. So yes, the glacial ice usually um, melts at a lower temperature than does regular ice. And it has to do with the rate at which it was compacted over time. Great question. Um, Ms. Brotland's class from East Brunswick also would like to know, what makes a glacier different from an ice cube or ice in a hockey rink? Um, so well, uh, what would make it different? So anytime we talk about a glacier, we're talking about ice that has some type of permanency. So um, when we study glaciers, we look for something that's called um, a mass balance. So we look to see um, like how quickly the ice is accumulated over time. So again, as you accumulate that, uh, the ice over time, it undergoes compaction over time. So I don't think it's so much different than ice, than an ice cube or in a hockey rink other than it's gone through compaction. And I, and I mentioned the rock cycle, so even like tying it back to that, um, you can have almost like metamorphic versions of ice um, that's gone through a series of compaction. So if you're looking at the top of a glacier, you're standing on the top of the glacier, below it, it gets more and more compact as you move down towards the bottom. Um, the other question was, what are some reasons why glaciers form? Um, glaciers form typically when the climate gets colder, right? So um, if your temperature goes be below 32 degrees, then you can have accumulation of precipitation on land. So in Iceland, um, you've got the Arctic Ocean in the north and you've got the Atlantic Ocean in the south and the wind precipitation is coming in from Greenland and it brings uh, moisture with it. And because Iceland is such uh, at a high uh, latitude, it's at 66 degree north, so it's just at the start of the Arctic Circle. Um, if the temperatures is cold enough, the precipitation that comes in is gonna precipitate as snow. And then that snow is gonna accumulate over time and then you're gonna have um, glaciers that begin to form. So glaciers are very thick, like glaciers can be more than two miles in thickness. What crystals can form inside of glaciers? Um, what crystals can form in, well, I, I suppose we could say that each of the individual snowflakes are a crystal in and of themselves. Um, I'm not sure about glaciers, about crystals forming inside of glaciers, other than sometimes what can happen is um, as these glaciers are moving, they, they break, right? So they create uh, crevasses. 
And, and when you have those crevasses or those like the gaps in between the ice sheet, you can have um, precipitation go down and through them, or um, they can act as a place that can absorb sunlight. And so you can increase meltwater. So sometimes what happens is when you have those crevasses, you can have water systems that are moving from the surface down those crevasses. And as the temperature down the glaciers can become colder, you can get more ice crystals to, to form. So it's kind of like a, a secondary process of ice forming. Sometimes though, the water goes all the way down to the base of the glacier. And, um, and that's not good for the, for the glacier because it, it makes it move, it makes it slide, uh, slide forward. And so, it, so it's a problem because you're moving glacial ice from high elevation to low elevation, and that's gonna increase the rate at which it melts. Okay, Mary from Scott Plains, let's see. Um, are there animals like bacteria that can live near the volcanoes? Yes, yeah, certainly, and they're really super fascinating to study because, um, so, so volcanoes, I'm thinking of specifically, but I'm even thinking of in terms of like geysers. So you can, so anytime you have the, the geothermal water that's below the surface, sometimes you can have pressure build up and have these geyser pools. And geysers are really, um, they're, they're very hot and they can host uh, very interesting types of bacteria because they've had to adapt to that temperature. And certainly near those volcanoes too, um, another component would be how that bacteria is adapting to things like sulfur. So volcanoes, when they erupt, are bringing with them sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. And, um, and so that's going to, um, you would think that it would limit, limit growth, but there are some types of bacteria that can adapt to those situations. Ooh, this is, okay. Um, so also, Mary from Scott Plains, is Iceland sinking under the weight of new lava? So is, is lava heavier when it is hot or cold? And, okay, so um, what's interesting about Iceland is that, um, is that we said that, that only about 26,000 years ago, Iceland was almost entirely covered in glacial ice. So now Iceland is covered only by 14% of ice. So glaciers that are about two miles in thickness have a lot of weight. So 26,000 years ago, two miles where the ice was compacting onto the surface. And now, because the ice is melted, what happens is you get an uplift of the bedrock that was underneath that glacial ice. So Iceland is going through a process that's called isostatic rebound, where the bedrock is being lifted. So you can imagine a situation like where you have memory foam, right? So you've got like a memory foam pillow and you put your hand in it and it squishes and then you pick your hand up and the memory foam, um, it, it re rebounds. So that's exactly the same thing that's happening to Iceland. So to Mary's question, um, what's happening then is as Iceland is being, as the bedrock is being uplifted, you get more cracks and crevices that allow for more magma and lava to come to the surface. And so, um, so the lava, it, when it's in its molten state, is lighter than when it solidifies. So you're right. So it is going to compact and, and change density as it begins to solidify. So it does become heavier. But the bigger process that's happening is that because you have the ice that is melting, you are giving a conduit for that more and more magma to come to the earth. So um, and we've seen this before in geologic time uh, at about 10,000 years ago. So as glacial ice increases and in its rate at which it melts, you also see an increase in volcanism. Okay. Julie's asking about Hanstrader Preserve and I'm, I'm not familiar with that term offhand, Julie. 
Could you also talk about what it's like traveling in the remote inner area of Iceland? Um, so it's, so for, for me, because I have a terrible sense of direction, you know, you can't be good at everything. And that is just something I have never been good at. Um, for, for me, when I, I initially tried to do it, I was alone and I was really scared of getting lost because it is so remote. And being in the interior, it kind of feels like being on the moon. Um, so I don't know if you picked up when you were looking at the picture vegetation on Iceland. So there's so especially in the interior, there's not like trees. So it's a very flat surface and it kind of looks like being on on the moon or something because it's all just like jagged rock that's exposed. Um, and so being in the interior, it's very quiet. Um, and if you lose your bearings, like if you if you if you lose where you're at, you're going to get lost really quick. And again, you know, usually when you when I'm doing the, my field work, it's during the summer. There's 22 hours of daylight, and so usually, like you could at least use the sun to figure out north, south, east, west. And in Iceland, because I'm you're so far north, there's 22 hours of daylight, and so the sun moves very little. And the sun never goes towards the horizon. It doesn't appear to go towards the horizon. It just appears to circle. So um, it's really an interesting um, to place to, to be. Um, in, yeah, in the interior. It's very desolate. Hardly anybody um, goes there. You have to do a lot of planning ahead of time to make sure that you have enough water. Um, uh, the good news is it never gets dark. So um, things like recharging solar power batteries is um, available. Good question. Rita's mom would like to know, are there any volcanoes that are overdue for an eruption? Yeah, we're looking at Atla. Last time it erupted was 1918. Christopher, how do geologists such as yourself know what geological or environmental event took? Oh, I answered that one. Um, Ayuda and Akul ask, why does I see so many volcanoes? Well, it has so many volcanoes because that hot spot is sitting underneath the island. And so that hot spot is the source of the magma for those volcanoes. And then it, and then it helps because you have a divergent plate boundary. So you have plates that are moving apart. And so just like if you're pulling anything apart, you've got a gap. And so it allows for that magma to come closer to the surface. China is here. That's evident. She gets extra credit. You mentioned a volcano that has not erupted in a while. When it does start showing signs of eruption, is there any way to tell how big of an eruption it will produce? Ooh. Um, I just tell you that geologists never like to get into the game of predicting really how big something is because that's really kind of backfired um for us in the past so it's really hard to make those those types of predictions about um about mother nature but we can look towards the past recurrence intervals right so we can we have a, we have a great understanding of what that 1918 event looked like and really we have a very good understanding of all the volcanic activity from present day from 874 because the 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 um, the Icelanders would write memoirs about their experiences related to the volcanoes. So again, when a volcano erupts, the more frequently it does, the smaller the eruption. So any time that a volcano goes into dormancy for a hundred years, you expect it to be a much bigger event. Yeah. All right, I think we're done with questions. Uh, thank you, Tammy. That was really wonderful. Um, I really enjoyed your talk, and I'm sure everyone else did. Um, so once again, thank you. And thank you to our audience who showed up today. And uh, if you were watching from Facebook, thank you as well. And so stay tuned. Um, OK, for... Ria, turning on to you. Yes. Um, so. Uh, stay tuned, everyone else. Our next Ask a Geologist um, series will continue on November 20th.
Um, and we will have a professor from Rutgers University um, in the Department of Material Sciences and Engineering. Dr. Ashutosh Goyal will be speaking about how to turn nuclear um, waste into ceramic glass. Um, so that again, that will be on November 20th, and that will be at 1 p.m. as well. Um, so stay tuned and thanks again, Tammy, and thank you for everyone who watched today and enjoy the weekend.